first let's turn to the word of God we're going to read from the one passage in the New Testament about the fruit of the Spirit Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 through to chapter 6 verse 5 so my brothers God meant you to be free on the other hand don't make this freedom an excuse for indulging your old self use it to show your love for others by putting yourselves at their service for the whole law can be expressed in just one principle namely you are to care for your fellow men as much as you do about yourself but if you snap at each other and pull each other to pieces watch out that you don't end up by exterminating each other altogether the approach I'm advocating is to let God's Spirit decide each step you take. Then you just won't try to satisfy the desires of your old self, whose cravings are diametrically opposed to what God's Spirit wants, and vice versa. The two are incompatible, which is why you find you can't always do what you really want to. If the Spirit is leading your life, you have nothing to fear from the law. When the old self is at work, the results are pretty obvious. It may produce promiscuity, dirty-mindedness, or indecency. It is behind occultism and drug addiction. It shows up in hatred, quarreling, jealousy, temper, rivalry, prejudice, and envy. It leads to binges, orgies, and things like that. I've warned you before, people who go on doing this sort of thing will have no share in God's coming reign. But when God's Spirit is at work, a fruit appears in the character. Each cluster includes loving care, deep happiness, and quiet serenity, endless patience, practical kindness, and unstinted generosity, steady reliability, gentle humility and firm self-control. No law has ever been passed forbidding such virtues and they have room to grow because those who belong to Christ have nailed their old self to the cross together with all its passions and appetites. If God's Spirit is leading our lives, let the same Spirit keep us in step with each other. We get out of step when our hollow pride wants a reputation of being ahead, regards others as rivals, and is envious of their progress. Brothers, if anyone slips up and is caught doing wrong, those of you who are spiritually mature should get him on his feet again, but handle him gently and humbly, keeping an eye on yourself, for sudden temptation could just as easily hit you. When the strain is too much, help to carry each other's burdens. This is simply carrying out Christ's instructions. If anyone thinks he is too important to stoop to this, he really isn't worth anything and only fools himself. Let everyone weigh up his contribution to see whether he is doing enough. And then he can take pride in his own work without making odious comparisons with what others are doing. For each must shoulder his own load of responsibility. So we are just going to think this morning of that aspect of God's work in us which enables us to be like him, not by our own efforts but by what he produces in our character. John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus had two different ministries which were complementary to each other. John the Baptist came with the message, God can deal with your past, which is something no one else can deal with. Do you realize that every single thing you've said or done or felt is recorded in you? You may not be able to remember it when you want to, but it's recorded and it's there and it's part of you. And not one of us can cut this link with the past. Our present action is controlled by our past decisions. 
and so we are part of our past. But God performs the miracle of forgiveness and our chains fall off, our heart was free and we rise, go forth and follow Christ. And so God can deal with the past and John the Baptist's ministry was just that. Come and be baptized in the Jordan River and let God deal with your past and cut you off from it and wash it away and give you a clean start so that the past is no longer going to control your present and your future. Now that was good news, his call to repentance. But he recognized that his ministry was inadequate at this point. While he could offer God's help to deal with the past, he could not offer God's help to deal with the future. And there is no good news in just being told your past is forgiven and forgotten. You've got a clean start now. Off you go on your own and see if you can do any better this time. That's not good news. We need our future dealing with by God as well as our past. And that's why John the Baptist said, I baptize you in water. That deals with your past. That cuts the past off. That deals with all the weakness that there has been. But there's someone coming after me who will baptize in Holy Spirit. That will deal with your future. We not only need pardon for the past, we need power for the future. We know perfectly well that no matter how many chances God gave us to start again, we would simply revert to what happened before, unless there is a new power in our life. May I take an example from modern psychiatric treatment? What is popularly known as electric shock treatment, which can be a real help to those whose patterns of thought have so gripped them that they need a real break from them. But any psychiatrist will tell you this, that that simply gives a temporary break and that the person will revert to the pattern of before unless some new affection, some new power, some new factor enters in during the gap, during the break, that will change the future. So that a break from the past is not enough. We need a break with our future, the future that would inevitably return if we're left on the do-it-yourself basis. So let's get out of our minds from the beginning that God calls us to a do-it-yourself Christianity, to trying, to eff making an effort to be what he wants us to be. It is his glorious plan and his good news that he wants to help us from beginning to end. He wants to give us pardon for our past and power for our future. And therefore, if ever I am to be a real Christian, then it will be God who will have to do it in me. I will not manage it myself. And his Holy Spirit is given to us precisely for this purpose. And the two things that the Holy Spirit gives to help us to be Christians are the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. And we will not be a full Christian until we have both. I'm going to use this machine this morning just to help to fix certain things in our minds. The Holy Spirit wants to give us two things, gift and fruit. Gifts so that we may do what Jesus did. And fruit that we may be what Jesus was. For you see, a Christian is very simply a Christian, someone who will do what Jesus did and someone who will be what Jesus was. It is as simple as that. Now which of us can say, I will do what Jesus did, I will be what Jesus was? There isn't one of us could even begin to make such a promise. Yet anything less than that is less than a full Christian. And so God in his mercy has given us gifts of the Spirit to do what Jesus did and fruit of the Spirit to be what Jesus was. Could anything be simpler? Could anything be more wonderful? This is good news. Preachers who preach true Christianity don't say, go out, go home and try to do your best and try to be like Jesus. If he's saying that, he's not lifting you at all. In fact, the more you say that, the more you make it impossible. For the standards of Jesus were the strictest standards they have ever been. He lifted moral and spiritual standards to an all-time high. In fact, his one standard was this. Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. No other religious teacher is dead, I think, to make such a categorical statement. How can I be perfect? Well, of course, God doesn't expect me to be. He says, my Holy Spirit will do what you can't do. 
Now this morning we're going to be looking at the fruit rather than the gifts. We've spent three Sunday mornings looking at the gifts, which enable us to do what Jesus did. But now we look at something deeper, even more important. Neither gifts nor fruit are automatic. They are both available to be appropriated. But it is not true that if I become a Christian that automatically I will receive gifts and grow fruit. I'm going to talk about the conditions this morning of growing fruit, how we do that, how we appropriate fruit. They are appropriated in different ways to the gifts, but are just as necessary if not more so. Now the gifts are more spectacular, they're more difficult to handle, therefore there is much more teaching in the scripture about how to handle gifts. And the message we've got from the last three Sunday mornings from 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 is this, you can't handle the gifts without the fruit, not properly. You'll run into trouble if you do, but nowhere in the scripture is there any guidance whatever about how to handle the fruit when you get it, for an obvious reason that when you grow the fruit of the spirit you can handle yourself, for the last one is self-control. And there are no rules. Against such there is no law. There are no regulations. There's not a single regulation in the scripture to tell you how to handle love or joy or peace or patience or kindness or goodness. They just tell you to exercise these things and let them go. Now I could draw many comparisons between fruit and gifts. It may be helpful if we do for a moment. Both are supernatural. Natural gifts and natural virtues are quite distinct from supernatural gifts and supernatural fruit. I'll show you how in a moment. Both are social gifts of God, primarily given to relate us to other people. All the gifts of the Spirit bar one are given to me to pass on to the body of Christ. All the fruit of the Spirit are given to me to relate properly to others to God and to myself. But gifts and fruit are primarily concerned with relationships. They are not private things. And invariably, if I make my quest for fruit and gifts a private one, just for me, something goes wrong. The gifts and the fruit are for us, not for me. And they are to be sought within fellowship and in relationship. Both of them will produce in us Christ-likeness. And that's the objective that God has before him. Both can be imitated, both by men and by Satan. You may remember that Antichrist will have the face of a lamb. And unfortunately, both gifts and fruit can be imitated. But discernment will tell you when it's the real thing. It is true, for example, that you'll find a lot of happy unbelievers who don't possess the spirit, neither can they, for the world doesn't know him can't receive him, and yet you'll find happy neighbors. You'll find some kind neighbors down your street. You'll find all these virtues apparently in unbelievers. And we've got to ask this morning, how do you tell when it's the fruit of the Spirit, as distinct from those nice kind neighbors you've got, who seem, sometimes maybe you feel, to be kinder than those you meet inside the church. How do we explain this, if it's fruit of the Spirit? But it's the differences that hit me most. Let me just look at some of the differences between gifts and fruit. First of all, gifts tend to be outward things. They show outwardly. They can be seen and heard. You know when they're going on. They are outward things, largely things that we do. Whereas fruit is inward. That's the first great difference. Then a second great difference is that gifts appear suddenly. They can be given in a moment, in a flash. It may take one second for a gift to be given to someone. Whether they use it immediately or not, they can use it immediately, it's given, quite suddenly. Secondly, fruit appears gradually. It does in your garden, it does in your personality. The fruit of the Spirit never appeared overnight. It grows. It's interesting that the word fruit is a word straight from nature. Next, gifts are temporary things, whereas fruit is permanent. I mean by that that gifts can come and go. And a person having exercised gifts can lose that gift. Samson did very quickly. 
But fruit, having come gradually, tends to stay, and indeed there'll come a day in the future when all the gifts will pass away, but the fruit will remain. So that there's a difference there. I did use the illustration a week or two ago about the scaffolding and the building. Gifts are the scaffolding which is then taken away. Fruit belongs to the building. Another difference is that gifts appear earlier in the Christian life. Fruit appears later. Gifts can be given to a very immature Christian, a carnal Christian, who's only just begun the Christian life, who still has a long, long way to go to be holy. This is one of the things that puzzles some Christians. Why gifts can appear in unholy people when it's the Holy Spirit giving them? But the simple fact is that the Holy Spirit is prepared to give gifts earlier. He's prepared to give gifts straight away to a new convert. And there are many occasions in the Acts of the Apostles where Christians who've just been born again exercise gifts of the Spirit, but they do not then show fruit of the Spirit. This belongs to the immature, this belongs to the mature, and therefore fruit takes time to appear. The biggest contrast is one that I'll say a lot more on in a moment, and that is that the gifts are many, the fruit is one. You can have the gifts spread out so that one person has one gift and another has another. Indeed, that's God's plan. But you can't have any of the fruit without all the others when it's spirit fruit. That is one of the most profound differences between the fruit of the spirit and the apparent appearance of these virtues in ungodly people and those who don't know Christ. You will never find all nine in an unbeliever. You may find one or two, and that tells you something about that one or two, but you'll never find all nine apart from the fruit of the Spirit. So gifts are many and varied and are divided between Christians. Fruit is one, and the whole lot appear simultaneously in each Christian who has learned how to cultivate the fruit. Now, I think at this stage it would be better if I just ran through the nine flavors of the fruit of the Spirit so that we've got them clearly in our minds. You've seen them down there, so you can... There don't seem to be nine there. One, two... Oh, there are two at the end, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six... Right. <laughs> I'm going to divide them up into the gifts that relate us to God, what I would call the Godward gifts. One, two, three... Then the manward fruit, those that relate us to other people, four, five, six. And then the selfward fruit, which helps us to be related to ourselves properly. That's one of the most difficult things to achieve. It's difficult enough relating to other people, but the most difficult person you probably have to get on with is you. That person you see in the mirror every morning when you shave or brush your hair very difficult person to get to know properly, very difficult person to relate to and accept as he or she is, so the fruit of the Spirit help there. Now, do you mind if I give you the paraphrase that I used earlier? First of all, loving care. The word love, you know, is so abused because the English language is so limited and inadequate. You know, anybody here from the northwest of Scotland, anybody here speak Gaelic? No, that's sad because um, you could do your courting so much better in the Gaelic. The Gaelic has 20 different ways of telling someone you love them. Did you know that? Makes for much variety. The typical Englishman can only say one thing, I love you, and he usually says that in a rather wooden and embarrassed way. Now the Gaelic have 10, 20 ways of saying I love you. The Greeks had four ways of saying it. And it's intriguing that the word love as used in the scripture is a translation of the rarest word that was hardly ever used between Greeks when they said, I love you. Because the word that they used meant, whatever you do to me, and even though I'm not attracted to you, I care for you so deeply that I will always seek your best good, whatever it costs me. I have to paraphrase the word with a whole sentence like that to get it across. It's an incredible word, and the English word care, 
probably is nearer to it than the English word love. You see, love to us is an emotional word which is a response to someone you're attracted by. And that's nothing to do with the fruit of the Spirit. That's a Greek word, eros, and if you go to Piccadilly, you'll see the statue of Eros. It's a tragedy that that statue was put up and called Eros, because it's a memorial to Lord Shaftesbury, and it's a memorial to his work for the children who were virtually slave labor in the factories and down the mines and on the pantomime stages of this country. And Lord Shaftesbury so cared about those children, though he got nothing back from them. He so cared that he fought for their freedom and he fought for the ending of the abuse of children in this country. And so when he died, they put up a monument to him and they should have called it agape because that's the Greek word for caring. And alas, they've called it eros and it's probably more appropriate with what goes on in Piccadilly Circus today. But it's not the word here. Love means so to care about someone else, whether they care about you or not, whether they attract you or not, but so to care about them that you've got to seek their good. And that's the kind of love that God has for us and the kind of love that Christ had for people. And it's the first fruit of the Spirit. And I tell you that we do not find this kind of love very frequently in a world that doesn't know Christ. The next one is, I'll call it deep happiness. Deep happiness, because joy is very deep. It's so deep that no one can take it from you. Now, there are many pleasures in the world, but unfortunately, you can lose those pleasures. As you get older, you use the, lose the pleasure of many things that made you enjoy yourself when you were younger. There's much happiness in the world, but that happiness comes to an end because it's usually founded on people, and people are taken away from us. But the fruit of the Spirit is a joy that no one can ever rob you of. It's something that no one can take from you. Deep happiness. Peace is the next word, and there are so many using that word lightly, especially in political circles, that I want to call it quiet serenity. Or I would maybe use the word harmony instead of serenity. The word peace, it's a lovely word, shalom, salam. It means harmony. May your body be in harmony, that means physical health. May your mind be in harmony, that means free from worry. May your spirit be in harmony, that means forgiven by God, you love him. And so the word peace here includes harmony, total harmony with yourself, with others, with God, with your environment, with your responsibilities, with your job, with your boss. Wouldn't you like that? Well, that's the fruit of the spirit. Now, all these three primarily relate us to God. We have peace with God. We have joy in God. We love God, and that's why they can't be taken away. When it comes to relating to other people, three fruit of the Spirit, endless patience. The Greek is an interesting word. It means to be slow-tempered. Isn't that an intriguing word? It's an English word. Have you ever used it? Hands up if you've ever used it. One person has. Two, slow-tempered. Isn't that intriguing? How many of you have ever used the word quick-tempered? Does that tell you how much the fruit of the Spirit is needed? Isn't it striking? Slow-tempered. That does not mean that a person full of the fruit of the Spirit will never be angry. Jesus was angry. But like his father, he was slow to anger. Yes, God can be angry, but it takes him time. He doesn't fly off the handle as we do with other people. The next, practical kindness. I hardly need to explain that because you know perfectly well when you meet it. Practical kindness. It means a feeling for people. Do you know it was used in the ancient world of wine that had been well stored for a long time and had become mellow. Mellow. Does that give you the flavor? Number six, good or goodness, but I'm going to translate it, sorry about this pen, unstinted generosity, because the word good in the Bible means generous. It means to have a generous mind so that you recognize the work of God wherever it happens. It means to have a generous hand so that when you meet a need, you want to meet it. There are only two men in the Bible ever called good, did you know that? They both had the same name, Joseph. Two men in the New Testament, Joseph of Arimathea, was called good. Why? Because he had a good mind, 
he believed in the kingdom of God and he stood up for Jesus at the trial. And he had a good generous hand because he gave his own tomb to Jesus to be buried in. And the other man is Joseph called Barnabas. And Barnabas was a man who went to Antioch with the suspicions of the Jerusalem church to see what was going on and came back and said, that's the work of God going on. He had a generous mind. He also had a generous hand because he sold a field and brought the proceeds to meet the needs of the poor. Good is generous. Now finally, the three towards ourselves. First of all, and oh, what a beautiful fruit this is, steady reliability. It means the people who will always be there without your asking. The people you can ask to do something and forget it because you can depend on them. The people who keep going and who, if they sent you a letter and signed it, yours faithfully would mean it. Faithfulness. Number eight, gentle humility. Which doesn't mean the kind of meekness that is weakness or mildness, but the kind of meekness that is literally, and I use the Greek word here, tamed. 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 Moses was the most meek man on the face of the earth because he'd been tamed. And this unruly nature of ours needs taming. And finally, and this leads from the last, firm self-control, which I would define very simply as the ability to say no to yourself. The ability to say no to yourself. Do you realize that as we've described this, we've been painting a portrait of Jesus. Painting a portrait of Jesus. Now I want to go back to something. Do you remember I said that the big difference between gifts and fruit was that gifts were many, fruit is one. All these nine things are one fruit. The dear member who does the bulletin rang me up after reading my notes for the bulletin this morning and said, do you mean to say fruit or fruits? that you're going to preach on tomorrow morning. And I said, fruit, singular. There is only one fruit of the Spirit. It has nine flavors. Do you remember my telling you about a fruit that some of you had never heard about called Mysteriosis Deliciosis? You still don't believe me, half of you. How many have we here this morning who've eaten that fruit? Good. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, oh, good. Well, will you tell them afterwards? Ah, oh, the person who did the bulletin. You've had it. Great. <laughs> well, now, this one fruit has different flavors as you eat it. It's the only fruit we know of that has different tastes within one fruit. And there is such a fruit in nature, but there can be such a fruit in human nature. All these nine things will appear simultaneously. That is the difference between human virtue and fruit of the Spirit. Human virtue says, I'm going to try and be more loving this year, and then next year I'll try and be more joyful. The year after that, I'll really try and be at peace, and the year after that, I'll try and be patient with my children. And it's piecemeal, bitty. And you find that some of them you can manage better than others because of your temperament. But the fruit of the Spirit provides you with the whole lot in one go. But it comes gradually so that if the fruit of the Spirit is growing in you, you will have a little more love and a little more joy and a little more peace and a little more patience, a little more kindness, a little more goodness, a little more fidelity, a little more meekness, a little more self-control, all at once. Now the significance of that is this, and here I'm going to be utterly practical. I'm going to talk about temperament. And I'm going to talk about the four major temperaments. You can see them carved in limestone in the fireplace on the first floor of Guildford House, above the law court, where the clock is. Go upstairs there and look at the fireplace. And carved out of a lump of limestone from the, or lump of chalk from the hog's back, you'll see four figures. Look at all four faces and see which is most like yourself. But there are the four temperaments, the sanguine, the choleric, the melancholic and the phlegmatic. Now some people are clearly in one of these brackets and some people are a bit of a mixture. And some have 60% of one, 20% of another, and 20% of a third. But most of us can recognize ourselves at some point. Now here is the interesting thing. Let's see if we can make a little chart. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. Now let's look at the four temperaments. Let's look first at the sanguine temperament. I'm not going to give you the characteristics, I'm just going to look at them here. 
Now here's what a sanguine man already has. He's got a certain joy, he's the life and soul of the party, he's happy, everybody comes and gathers around him and he enjoys being the life and soul of the party and full of humor. He's got quite a lot of patience with people, he's easy going. He's got a measure of kindness and you'll find that he's got a streak of generosity. And that's all he's got. He lacks self-control to a remarkable degree and is very undisciplined in his life by nature. He lacks meekness because he likes to be a bit of a show-off. He lacks love. And he lacks faithfulness. You can't pin him down. You can't keep him at a thing for too long. He's not reliable. He's got lovable qualities. But you see, he needs desperately the fruit of the Spirit. Or take the choleric. I'm sure you've seen him, probably by his red face. But let's look at what he has. He's got, usually, some joy. He's quite an extrovert. He's usually got tremendous faithfulness because he's got stickability. That's part of his temperament and nature. And he's also got incredible self-control. He's master of himself. But there's some pretty big gaps, and patience, kindness, and goodness is the most obvious one. So usually, he has most difficulty relating to other people. He's probably got a better grip of himself than others, certainly than the penguin has. He still lacks love, real caring. Or take the melancholic. I hope you're not thinking of anybody else while I go through this. As the lady said, the sermon was right above my head because I was hoping it was going to hit the person in the pew behind. Well, now the melancholic, he has a lot of patience. He has a lot of kindness. He doesn't have a lot of generosity. He's rather stingy. He has faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. And the melancholic can contribute those things. But he does lack a number of things. And above all, love, joy, and peace. You don't see them much in him. He can't understand or sympathize with people who have a lot of joy, for example. Just can't think what they're getting all excited about. And finally, the phlegmatic. Am I spelling it right? <laughs> the phlegmatic, he has, uh, what does he have? He has joy. He has peace. Lots of it. He's terribly placid. He takes life as it comes. People say, oh, I do admire his peace. Well, it isn't necessarily a virtue. He has patience. He has kindness. That's about all he has. Now then, are you beginning to see something very important? If you look at people's virtues and try and overlook their vices, or at least their lack of virtues, then you can see a little bit of good in everyone. You can see some of these qualities in most people. But what you can't see is an all-round character. What you can't see is the virtues in balance. What you can't see is Christ-likeness, because if you study Christ's life in detail and go into it thoroughly and try and put him in one of these four temperamental brackets, you cannot do it. You can't do it. All of these four need love, which is why Jesus came and said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And love is the one thing you don't find by nature in any of these four temperaments, not in the definition of scripture. And you find these other things very patchily. And so you do maybe have a very kind neighbor who lives alongside you, could be one of those three temperaments. I'm sure he's not a choleric neighbor. He would probably argue with you about the fence or something. But you find three kind neighbors out of four. Doesn't mean the fruit of the Spirit has started growing in their life, far from it. The Lord wants all-round character. Because you see, not only is the fruit of the Spirit a picture of Jesus, but he is a perfect picture of God, and you'll find all these fruit of the Spirit in God. For God is loving, and God is a happy God. He rejoices over you with singing. And God is the God of peace, and God is the God of patience. And God is a kind God and a generous, good God. And God is a faithful God. And God can be very meek. Look how he sent his son into the world. And God supremely is in control of himself. So it's a lovely picture of God. Now then, here's what I want to say. If man is made in the image of God, and that image is not lost, marred but not lost, do you see that what has happened to the image of God in normal human nature is that normally our temperament can only reflect so much of God.
we can't be perfectly like him. And the Greek word translated perfect is the same word that means complete. And Jesus said, be ye complete as your Father in heaven is complete. That's the rub. And the trouble is that somebody who's kind by temperament thinks that they're all right and doesn't need the fruit of the Spirit, but they need it desperately and they need to balance it out. What is the object of Christ in saving us? I will tell you that the image of God may be restored in everyone and that we may all develop rounded, complete characters. What will happen if we don't? And here, forgive me, I want to be very personal. I want to tell you the problem. This is the problem. Every marriage between two people is incompatible. I'm not being cynical. Every marriage is incompatible because every marriage is between different temperaments. Sometimes opposite attracts. Sometimes two people are attracted because they're so similar. Either way is disastrous. Unless, unless when they marry they realize they're going to need more than they've got already. For every marriage is between incompatibles and requires adjustment between the two. There are gaps in both and when the gaps coincide that marriage is needing help. Now then, I want you to see that the church is like a gigantic marriage between a whole lot of people. Now, it's sometimes difficult enough giving guidance to two people in a marriage. Can you imagine trying to keep 500 together in a loving relationship? When the temperaments are different, when by nature people cannot get on well together. Now, let me take this very frankly to a very deep degree. Unless Christians in a church are prepared to grow the fruit of the Spirit, then certain things are bound to happen. Here are the possibilities. Number one, you can only hold the church together by keeping people separate and by not letting them get too close together. Keep them fairly separate. Keep them just on a formal, polite relationship. Don't get them involved with each other. Let them come to church. Let them say good morning politely. Let them dress up in Sunday best and keep well away. And you can have a united church without the fruit of the Spirit. And many churches are doing exactly that. And they don't have any deep unity. They simply manage to survive by not getting too involved. The second possibility is this, you can develop cliques within a fellowship so that those who can get on stay within their group. That can happen in churches, especially when that clique centers around a leader or a particular temperament. Then you get the kind of situation, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Clifford Smallman, I am of Stuart Arnold, I am of David Pawson, or I am hoping to be of the next one. And so you get temperamental cliques. Or thirdly, unless the fruit of the Spirit grows, then you get people changing churches when the relationship becomes too difficult. And they move on to a church where they feel that temperamentally they will be more at home. It is an absolute scandal that the idea has got about that you choose your church according to your temperament and what suits you. And that one has a Baptist temperament and another has an Anglican temperament. Show me in scripture where there is any ground whatever for saying that. As soon as we talk like that, we are admitting that we haven't grown the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we're admitting. So if I can put it like this, it's just pure alliteration that made me sit, say this. But here is the pastor's problem, the elder's problem, to get a whole bunch of people, phlegmatic finance committees, choleric caretakers, melancholic musicians, and sanguine stewards, and all the rest of them, <laughs> and put them together. And unless they are growing fruit of the Spirit, you know that it's only a question of time till there will be an upset and they'll change and go. And that's why fruit of the Spirit is a vital necessity in a church. So vital that we cannot fulfill God's will without it. Because God's will is not that we should find our temperamental home. God's will is that we should all attain to the fullness of the stature of Jesus. 
which means that we should all have all the fruit of the Spirit. And when you do, you can get along with anyone, no matter what their temperament has been. And there can be real unity, and you can get close to each other without irritating, without upset. And so gifts of the Spirit are one help from God, but fruit of the Spirit is another which is absolutely vital, that we all may attain to the stature of Jesus and all may grow up. It is a sad thing when you notice that someone stops growing fruit. And you wonder how long they will be able to carry on. You know that they will carry on to a bursting point where their temperament can take no more. And the split occurs. And a marriage has been broken. For that's what we are. We're married to Christ and to each other. And so it's urgent that we grow fruit of the Spirit. And that we know how to. So in the last few minutes may I talk about how to grow fruit. I must give you a little bit of horticulture now. I want to say first that there is no shortcut for fruit is a byproduct, not a product. And the way we grow fruit is different from the way we receive gifts of the Spirit. That's why the verbs in the scripture are always different for fruit than to gifts. Do you remember the hymn, uh, Holy Spirit, um, no I've forgotten all of it, but the last two lines, the first verse, of thy gifts at Pentecost. Give us heavenly love. You know that hymn? That's got it all wrong. Love is not a gift. It's a fruit. And you can't be given it. It's got to grow. There are just two things, two conditions for growing fruit. Spiritual fruit. One, abide in Christ. And two, walk in spirit. Let me spell it out briefly. Abide in Christ. It's one thing to start with Christ. It's another thing to continue. Do you love your Lord Jesus in the same way that you did when you first fell in love with him? Are you still as glad to spend time with him? Are you still fostering the relationship as you did then? That's what abiding in Christ means. Staying with him. You know, you get to be like the people you live with, and abiding in Christ means living with him all the time. And as you do, then without you realizing it, the branch is abiding in the vine, and you be bear much fruit, and the fruit begins to grow. All of us tend to copy the people we mix with. That's why as soon as you see a young person get into bad company, you know that it won't be long before they begin to be influenced. All of us are influenced by the people we live with and by the people we admire. And abiding in Christ means stay with him, stay with him, keep in love with him, foster that relationship that you had at the beginning. Don't let it go with the honeymoon, let life be one long honeymoon with Jesus. And abiding in Christ means not only abiding in the head, but abiding in the body too. And you can't abide in Christ unless you're abiding in his body and remaining firmly within it. So abiding in Christ is the first condition. The second condition is walking in the Spirit. And as I understand it, that does not mean jumping about in the Spirit, nor does it mean running in the Spirit. It means what it says, walk in the Spirit. It means this, that every single step I take in response to the Spirit will just swell the fruit out a little more. No shortcut. Conventions and conferences thrive on people trying to find a shortcut, hoping to go away for a week and come back full of the fruit. Just doesn't occur that way. But as I walk, as the Spirit says, do this and I do it, the fruit grows just a little. And the next time he says, do this, and I am led of the Spirit, it grows a little more. That's the only way to grow this fruit. Abide in Christ, stay with Christ, and walk in the Spirit. Which means this on the negative side that as soon as I dig my heels in and say I'm not going with the Spirit in this, the fruit stops growing. And the more I do that, the more it begins to shrivel because it hasn't got the nourishment it needs to swell and ripen. And that's the tragedy one can see in one's own life, in other people's lives. When people stop walking in the Spirit, when they say I'm not doing that, I'm not going that far, I'm not going to be led any further, here I stay. As soon as they do that, you begin to see the fruit begin to shrivel and it stops growing and there is no choice if we're going to grow this fruit we've got to go wherever the spirit leads we've got
God to respond to the Spirit, whatever He does, whether our old temperament likes it or not. If we're going to fill out the gaps in our temperament, we shall need to walk in the Spirit, and He'll fill out. I've seen melancholics become so full of hallelujahs that you wouldn't recognize them. How have they done it? Because the Spirit has called them and they've walked. They've stepped out in the Spirit and the melancholic shouts hallelujah. And one sees the choleric become kind. And one sees the sanguine become whatever he needs to become. I've forgotten. But one has seen human nature fill out. That's what happened to Simon Peter and we're studying his life on Sunday evening. Simon Peter filled out. He didn't cease to be Simon Peter. He didn't cease to have that lovely character that God gave him, but he became an all-round person, a complete person, and the gaps were filled in. Now that's the goal. And so I've got to say to me and to every one of you this morning, did there come a point where you said, so far and no further, I'm not letting the Spirit do that to me? When you did, you not only began to stop growing fruit, but you put yourself in a position where if the church went on walking in the Spirit, sooner or later your temperament would get to the point of no return and want out. So there really is no choice. I've got to go on walking in the Spirit. And whatever the Spirit says to me, I must do. Wherever He leads me, I must go. Whatever He prompts, I must respond. And then and only then will my temperament be filled out with a complete character of Jesus Christ. And if I pray, may the mind of Christ my Savior dwell in me from day to day, then I'm asking that I may have the courage to respond when the Spirit moves. One final question, which I'm sure is in your mind. To be baptized in Holy Spirit or filled with Holy Spirit or whatever care, word you care to use, fallen upon, poured out, I really don't mind what word you use as long as you think you have the same thing. What relationship has that to the fruit of the Spirit? Does it have any? My answer is yes, I believe it does. And I believe its relationship to the fruit of the Spirit as to the gifts is this. I believe that Christians who have never been filled with the Holy Spirit can be given a gift. And I believe that they can grow fruit. But I have seen this happen so often that when a Christian is drenched in Holy Spirit, plunged in Holy Spirit, it accelerates, it accelerates the release of gifts and the growth of fruit. Accelerates. You see, every Christian already has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, so he can begin to do a work. But when a person is drenched, then it accelerates the whole thing. It's like giving your plants a good watering. And so I want to finish by drawing a diagram, which some of you have seen me draw before, but it's so important. Let these circles represent increasing ripples on a floor. Ripples of your experience, your experience of conversion, your experience of baptism, your experience of being filled with the Spirit, your experience of gifts of the Spirit. Your experience, you see, is broadening all the time. But what is not happening, and this is vital for you to know, is that you are not growing thereby. For growth is vertical. And the fruit grows up here. This is why you can have the extraordinary situation that a person can be exercising gifts and showing little fruit. This is also why, and this is so important, there are some people whose experience of the Lord is narrow, but who within that narrow experience have walked in the Spirit over the years, and because they've walked for many years, they have developed the fruit. And they have become mature Christians. They lack a broad experience of the Lord, but they've grown tall. And it is vital, and I say this very strongly, that a person down here with a broad experience including gifts of the Spirit still needs to look up with respect to a person here who has had none of the gifts but who has grown the fruit. That is fundamental. On the other hand, the person up here should look at this person and say, they have an experience that I have not had and which maybe the Lord wants me to have. 
because what the Lord does want are strong pillars in the church who have a broad base and have grown tall. These are the pillars of God's church. And so you can have in a church a mixture of those who've grown mature on a, a narrow basis of experience, but who for 20, 30, 40 years have so walked as the Spirit led them that over a long time they have grown the fruit of the Spirit. They could have grown it more quickly if they'd had a broader experience of being filled with the Spirit, but they've grown the fruit. And therefore it is not right, it is not fitting that those who've exercised gifts should look down on senior Christians who have not had those gifts. But oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if all those who've got fruit would have gifts? And if all those who've got gifts would develop the fruit and begin to grow and grow and grow and grow. For what God wants is people with broad experience and tall maturity. Those who've grown up to the stature of Jesus because he had gifts of the Spirit and he had all the fruit of the Spirit and he was complete as God is complete. And so we've talked together about the fruit of the Spirit this morning. We've talked about gifts, but fruit is even more important. Abide in Christ, walk in the Spirit, until your temperament has so filled out the gaps that you can stay in a church, that you can get close to people without upsetting them or being upset by them, until the temperaments are blended together and the body of Christ is proof to the world that any individual can have all of the virtues and not just some of them. That will be finally the distinguishing mark between the Church of Christ and the virtues that the world can show. Let us pray.